This episode of the Kill by Kill podcast is brought to you by the all new Scream. It's now available to buy or rent tonight on digital. Scream stars Nev Campbell, David Arquette, and Courtney Cox. This hit new movie is certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, and critics are calling it 100% terrifying. Buy it on digital today, and you'll get access to killer bonus content, including deleted scenes, casting reviews, and much more. Now, Scream is available at participating retailers. It's rated R, and it's from Paramount Pictures. If you listen to our review of the new Scream, you know that we love every bloody minute of it. Now, maybe this is your first time, or you just want to relive the whole experience. Well, you know, everyone has a chance to watch this new entry in the Scream franchise. It's on digital in your very own home. And to celebrate, I have five copies to give away to our Kill by Kill listeners. All you need to do is email us at killbykillpod at gmail.com with Scream in the subject line. You tell me your favorite scary movie, and you can watch Scream on us. Uh, Do it today. Oh, and by the way, the body count continues. dedicated to celebrating the least discussed component of any horror film, the characters. We're going to unpack all the gorious details of He Knows You're Alone in the hopes that a young bride-to-be's untimely end is just the beginning of the jokes that we might make at her expense. And as always, there's only one person I trust, that if I tell her I'm scared, I don't want to be in this movie theater anymore, and I think someone's following me, she'll just take the popcorn with her. And me, the one, the only, Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing today, Gina? I'm good. I I, I brought you a goldfish. Ooh, that's so special. Wait a second. My fish tank is full of fucking goldfish, Gina. How many times have you visited me before? Well, they'll just nibble on each other if they need food. It's okay. <laughs> that's right. You save a lot on fish food when all of the goldfish uh, start to uh, cannibalize one another. Exactly. <laughs> I don't want to scare you, Gina, but we are not alone. That is right. We have a special guest. You know her as a writer for Grimm Magazine and her series of slasher film video essays called Blood Assurance. The one, the only Vincent Beck. How are you doing today, Vincent? I'm doing great. Excellent. I'm so happy you are here. Um, Now, Vincent, uh, you have written an academic paper, believe it or not, audience, on this very film. And it's um, interesting attitudes towards women. <laughs> yeah. as, soon as, as soon as I read about that, I'm like, well, I had no interest in He Knows You're Alone from my viewing of it 30 years ago. But now there's an actual context and point of view that I want to hear about this movie. So I'm very glad you're here to talk about it. Well, I'm excited to you. I was introduced to it as a um, kind of Halloween ripoff uh, film and... I don't know. I've come to find that there's so much more to it than that. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you do realize it is a Halloween. Oh yes. Film. It, I mean, yeah. There are things. Yeah, that like are taken the, the, from the, the first one, other than <laughs> probably, after Friday the 13th, it, yeah. it's mostly notable for that. And the feature film debut of one Thomas Hanks. Yes. I mean, whatever became of that gentleman, he really pops off the screen here. Yeah, he did a couple things in the in the in the mid eighties. A, a TV show where he dresses in drag, and oh, that's and then right. a, and yeah. then a movie where he falls in love with a mermaid lady, and then really not much else after that. I do enjoy when he's dressed like a, a woman with the shaving cream on and sings Macho Man. I mean, that's the high point. <laughs> Everything after that seems like a okay, like anyone could pull that one off. <laughs> 
Um, so a little bit of a uh, backstory to he knows you're alone. The, the director of this motion picture uh, on the recent Blu-ray that uh, Screen Factory put out states that his intention was to, quote, make a thriller picture rather than a horror or slasher film. And it's quite possible that he has failed on all those accounts or combined them into a new genre. Well, I'm not particularly sure which. Um, so you were, uh, Vincent, you were, you were telling us how you were introduced to this film. Um, when was the first time you watched it? Um, it was, I think, 2016. I went mm-hmm. to, in, uh, I live in North Carolina and in Durham, North Carolina, a theater there that plays kind of independent films. They do a slasher festival every year where it's all slashers from the seventies and eighties that they play. Nice. And mm-hmm. um, this was one of them. And I like mm-hmm. to go in there blind and just pick one uh, sure. or a few. And so that's how I watched it first. <laughs> <laughs> so you had no expectations going in No. and it comes up and it, you, you watch the movie and you're, you come out, slightly charmed by what you have been offered yeah and okay. what what originally drew me to it is all the like kind of anti-marriage sentiments in it yeah, so like sure. originally oh, yeah. when i wanted to talk about it i wanted to talk about how progressive it was because of the anti-marriage <laughs> sentiments from the women of the film and uh-huh. then um that kind of fell apart once i kind of looked more into it and i realized it was not <laughs> so progressive <laughs> It's an interesting uh, dichotomy yeah. that this film has that it allows its its female characters to um, express doubts, uh, profess their preferences uh, when it comes to sexuality or romance or how they deal with the men in their lives, which is like a, an interesting component to it. But it's politics in in the sense of how it deals with its killer, his motivations, and his sort of, you know, how he operates yeah. <laughs> are so regressive <laughs> that it, it it boggles the mind. Yeah, and it's not just the killer either. Honestly, most people in the film are unlikable, but they really pull out some pretty bad male characters in this film. <laughs> oh, they're all they're all uniformly even even Tom Hanks. Is is kind of sleazy. <laughs> I've never. I don't. I don't know what to think of Tom Hanks playing a sleazy character. I mean, he's the most charming sleaze ball in the entire thing. At least he, you know, as it says please when he asks for goobers and offers them to other people. So there, there's the redeeming qualities too. But yeah, but even he's character. like, even he's. Even he's like, you know, he's been hanging out with this girl for like an hour. And he's like, hey, you want to go back to my apartment? <laughs> and <laughs> no? he, has to borrow, he has to borrow the money to call his roommate to get him out to bring her back. Like he has to borrow a dime from her. He can't even provide that. <laughs> you've got like, caught off you, guard. You've got like, like, you know, this useless detective character, which I, I think that's like my most, the most baffling part of the movie for me is, is they just drew this, they just added this detective character later who does nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he is, of all of the useless cops that we have covered on the show, and there been he a is lot. perhaps the most useless. <laughs> he, is, he, uh, he offers nothing. He takes nothing. He, I, now I don't know everything about the character. Obviously, I, I, the first time I watched this was like thirty years ago, uh, and this was the first time back. But uh, is he dying of consumption throughout this? Is he, um, <laughs> is he, is he weakened uh, like a like a uh, uh, a sort of uh, fey poet of the uh, uh, gilded age? I just don't know why he, rather than just simply calling the uh, the protagonist and saying, hey, you might be in danger, he just decides to follow her around to see if he can, <laughs> right. like, you know, catch this guy in action. There yeah, is, he uses her as bait. He's great. There's a lot of following around in this movie. When I was re-watching it, I was like, so she's got the killer following her. We expect that. But then her, like, ex-boyfriend comes out with saying her whole daily itinerary without her telling him and things like that. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. they're just all creepy. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. You've got this, you've got this. And and obviously I I think this, you know, I, I I will give them the benefit that this is on purpose that the, the, the nice guy ex-boyfriend is also a gigantic fucking creep. 
<laughs> who who cannot take no for an answer. Yes. And then and then in the end she ends up marrying him anyway. Well, well almost marrying him anyway. Yeah. But but <laughs> Gets as close as any of us have, have gotten, really. So that pretty much sets it up. Uh, let's let's talk about this movie. You know, when we open, uh, it's on the shot of a couple who is uh, making out in the backseat of a car uh, in what is supposed to be under a tree. But when it's the inside shots, it almost looks like they're on a double date with Keebler elves. <laughs> There, there's so much tree that's that's leaking into and on top of the car. Plus, uh, the heavy breathing has created a permanent haze on the windows. I don't know how they'll drive home after this fumbling sexual adventure they're going on. <laughs> yeah, that's about odd weather happening there. I don't know yes. what, quite what it is. The the environment inside the car is very hot and heavy. It's like uh, it's like Orlando, Florida inside, and then Massachusetts outside. It's it's a real different thing. Um, so I'll ask you, Gina, because you're you are prepared for this question. But if I had to choose a movie within a movie that we've covered in just the last year of the show. I'd still choose Killer Party over this. Yeah, I was going to say, this is at least the, the I mean, if you're counting like uh, Scream 4, this mm, is- Okay, uh, sure, yeah. Th- this is probably the, the third or fourth movie that has opened with a, a you know, fake out. Mm-hmm. But I like, I appreciated this one because it's, it's, it's basically th- that old campfire story about- uh, you know, the clicking on the door and yeah. it's, and it's, yeah. and the, the guy with a hook for a hand. And I, I, sure. uh, I, I got a kick out of that aspect of it. Yeah. And then, uh, she's, uh, trying to, uh, hold off his advances. It's a very, you know, standard, uh, sort of horror movie trope what's going on there. And then we discover it. no, this is a movie that uh, two people are watching uh, and uh, one of the girls decides that she can't take it. She's going to go downstairs to the bathroom. First, she's going to admire the hell out of her very healthy hair. Give it a quick <laughs> brush. You know, we all need it. And then uh, when she goes to take a pee, there's a sigh of satisfaction she gets from unbuttoning her pants that I really connected with. I mean, you do recall, Patrick, how tight pants were in the early 80s, right? <laughs> it's very true. Several people are, they're cursed with the tightness of the pants uh, throughout the movie. And we get to see them walk in a variety of environments. We get to see different kinds of pants, all of them very ill-fitting uh, for, you know, very, very uh, camera ready people. So I, I think it's a real problem with the pants and not the people. I was struck by how green this bathroom is. It's practically a, a bathroom inside of Sawsville, USA, Canada. <laughs> it's uh yeah. As far as grimy bathrooms go, if we're also talking grimy bathrooms, I assume that Scream 2 has a little bit of a riff going on what's happening with the opening of this motion picture. Yeah, that seems like it would be. Uh, it's it's lifted from this. I don't remember any other any other slasher movie from the same era that had this kind of scene in it. I mean, we do know that uh, that Ten to Midnight kind of has a bit of bathroom going on as well. Who is going to Who is going to lift from Ten to Midnight? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but we need more naked killers in horror movies. Just guys walking around with their dick hanging out. Uh, that's what we need. <laughs> Uh, what I was really encouraged by in this motion picture, though, was that once this young woman returns to her seat and communicates to her friend, I'm afraid, not just because of the movie, but I believe I'm being followed. And she's like, please let me eat the popcorn and watch this woman fumble around in a barn. Oh, yeah. Her friend is just like, uh, nah, no. you're fine. Just watch the movie. <laughs> yeah. She... She could give a solid fuck what she, what her friend cares about or what her emotions are. She has invested the, I don't know, dollar seventy five in whatever this movie is, and she's going to really wring out the enjoyment of it. Uh, but our killer arrives behind um, our would-be victim. And first time in a little bit, and I was really encouraged by this, we get a get bunked. In, we do on this show, and uh, Vincent, I'm not sure if you are uh, personally aware, but a get bunked on the show is when someone is killed through another object, and so being killed via knife through the back of the theater chair 
qualifies as a get bunked. Um, that knife is very sharp. That is a sharp knife. I was going to say, I feel really uh, traumatized by this scene because I don't know if you guys go to the AMC theaters with the um, reclining chairs and if you guys stay in the back row, but I always sit in the very back row and there's this space between the wall and the chairs so that they can recline. And it's Mm -hmm. the perfect space for like a person to hide. And every time, doesn't matter if I'm watching a horror movie or not, I'm afraid that I'm going to get like stabbed by a killer back there. (laughs) You're just like trying to look around without missing anything. Yeah. Vincent, I have to ask you, um, what do you think happened to this fellow that he looks so sunburned? (laughs) I have no idea. He must be like a construction worker, maybe (laughs) when he's not killing. (laughs) They got this. They must have gotten this actor direct from vacation because he has... The sunglasses line, like his yes. face is sunburned with like the, the the perfectly outlined space where his sunglasses would have been. It's like he just got off the plane from the Bahamas. He's got a reverse raccoon going on where he's sunburnt, but very pale right around his eyes. Which something you could probably get away with. I don't know if you gave him an ounce of makeup. But this film's like, no, 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 no. This is something we need to preserve about this character. So it means something. I just don't know what it means. There are brides everywhere. He could have been killing brides in the tropics (laughs) or in Hawaii. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. He could have gone to one of those all inclusive uh, uh, resorts. For the honeymoon. Where, you know, like, 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 like hedonism in in, in Jamaica or something like that. Just, uh, you know, he's a, he's a traveling bride killer. (laughs) Yes. He, I think. Well, if you were, if this is like a destination wedding thing and I now have to, I'm not only coming to your wedding, but I'm going to Hawaii or or Florida or Mexico to this wedding. And then the bride dies there. At least I get a vacation out of it. But if it's happening in Staten Island, I'm left in Staten Island. I I just, mm, I don't know. I'm not getting a whole bunch out of it. And yet he is independently wealthy. He can just travel willy nilly. Wherever he wants to go, he really is living quite the life. Yeah, he's a he's a you know you know, very well off serial killer. I really enjoyed the Halloween theme, but not that's happening within this motion picture. <laughs> this movie that the director definitely did not want to copy, but every element seems to have come across, including this. Um, what if we sped the Halloween theme up and left one note off? Now it's ours. <laughs> and it took two people to rip it off. Not just one guy behind a keyboard, which is the only instrument used. Uh, two people. So I assume they're sitting next to one another on the piano bench and one of them handles the right and the other one handles the left. I'm not sure how it works. <laughs> but I did really enjoy the police squad opening credits where we get oh, to see the police siren. I love those. I love those. Those are great. Like who would like, like what, what guest star would you, would you just want to <laughs> pop up and then immediately get killed? Uh, Lyle Wagner. I would love to see involved <laughs> in this. I'm going to go for uh, the guy that played uh, Isaac from the love boat. Oh, sure. Ted Lang. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, not uh, even have to get killed by the guy in the, in the movie, just, you know, some other way. <laughs> just he, he took over the role of the couple that didn't see anything f- from the murder scene. Vincent, have you ever heard of either of the people we just mentioned? No, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Most of our, you know, where we're, we're, you know, sometimes are we're old enough to be our guest parents on occasion. So it, <laughs> it makes for some lively conversation. <laughs> Uh, We are perhaps the oldest people in horror podcasting. We're not sure, but boy, it sure feels like that. We're up uh, there. More often than not. We are up there. So in the aftermath of this death and the police are called, we we are introduced to Detective Useless. And Detective Useless um, has a backstory that we will learn slowly in drips and drabs throughout the motion picture. Sometimes the, the movie just stops and allows someone to monologue what it is. Uh, But we do know this. He is very excited when a murderer comes back to give him, the detective who couldn't catch him the first time, a second chance. And I think we all deserve a dead body that will help us get the second chance. You're also burying the lead that for like a split second, his, it was not his partner, but uh, the other cop is uh, the the principal from the breakfast club. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 
Um, I was very excited. There, there seems to be a few people that you that <laughs> you yeah, have like seen uh, like um, the uh, her one friend's uh, professor slash lover is who's, yeah. you know, such a such a hunk. He's a hunk. <laughs> just can't can't just I'm, can't stay away from him. Is character actor James Rebhorn. If you ever wanted to see James Rebhorn in a primarily naked from the waist up role. Well, do I have a movie for you? Your fetish is about to get just activated <laughs> who right here. A, who has a very strange idea of foreplay. <laughs> <laughs> but we will get to that. Um, we do learn that Detective Useless, though, is now on the case. <laughs> and he also has a cold that will get worse and worse and worse throughout the uh, history of this motion picture. Uh, we are then cut to our uh, killer who has no, he doesn't really have a gimmick beyond the the people that he targets. Uh, he's just a guy, uh, but we will learn that he does have one special ability. Um, I'm sorry, two. One is taking the bus, which we all know is the scariest transportation. Bar none. <laughs> if you've ever taken that one bus that used to run from Chinatown in New York City up to Boston, you know how scary taking the bus is. Yeah, don't. Can be. Do, do not. <laughs> it's a gamble with your life. Secondly, uh, we learn that this gentleman's name is Ray, and he got jilted by uh, his bride to be. Um, and then she goes on to, uh, uh, you know, be proposed to and ha- have a wedding with someone else. But right before she can say her I do's, as she is getting ready, no one is near her, which is common, you know, bride to be thing. Like, leave that bride alone. Don't touch her up. She's got it handled. Uh, he gets up into that room and then does a maneuver, which I found rather interesting. He uses his left hand to grab her chin and just, I guess this is like a mandible claw, like in, in the WWF. Like when <laughs> mankind would like stick a finger in your tongue and then you would just crumple from the pressure somehow. He's doing, so um, like sort of like a like a like a Vulcan neck pinch or something. Yeah, exactly. But his hand over time becomes magic. This left hand can stop anyone from doing anything, allowing him to but graze you with a knife. And this woman is dead. That is all it takes is just a light stabbing. The amount of blood on his knife is like the tippy top. It's an inch of blood. And then I guess the rest of it came out clear. Like it's on fucking Farscape. I don't <laughs> understand how that works, but he is magic. You also forgot to mention he has an excellent kill face. <laughs> he does. He has a grimace. That's like his skulls trying to remove itself from his face. I think is how I would describe it. <laughs> Uh, now, Vincent, this is revealing what his backstory is, but his back, the backstory of this killer over time reveals itself to be a real philosophy. And I think you're, you're the one best equipped to walk us through this. It kind of goes into all the characters of the women and stuff too, but he's killing these brides to be, Mm -hmm. and it almost seems like He's killing them to kind of save their future husbands um, because the, the women are not characterized very uh, flatteringly either. Um, no, they, come on. Are you serious? Okay. <laughs> they, they are, uh, they, they kind of cheat a lot. Uh, well, the guys are implied to cheat too. So I guess it's just right. like, you know, yeah, these free are for very all. open relationships. <laughs> yes. Um, but they're, they're kind of characterized to be very kind of controlling, demanding, flighty, mm-hmm. um, backstabbing and so yeah it's almost like he if he killed them because they decided not to be married then it would be more like he was angry that they uh didn't want to fall into traditional roles of marriage but the Mm -hmm. fact that he kills them before they're ever married and uh, is where it kind of seems like he's preventing the men from marrying them to try and save them from these women that he sees similar to the one that ruined his life Right. <laughs> Cause they, because apparently, not not a spoiler alert, everyone, this is a condition that's catching. Yes. So, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. 
Something is in the water in this town. <laughs> I think Ray is infected. Like, this is an idea that's bigger than just him. He's just starting it off and everyone's picking up like, oh, I got to get in on this killing the brides to be uh, business. It's booming, everyone. His idea that I have to stop these marriages. The only way I can do it by killing the bride. But the men will all be better off because of this, because I have found the the bride's half of this marriage to be lacking in some way, shape, or form. Like he's making uniform decisions that have a, a, as you state, like a deep philosophy connected to them. Yeah. And so we finally, after this flashback. Uh, in which we, uh, you know, get to meet his magic hand. Is it implied that he is grabbing her tongue? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I feel like it's the jaw. Yeah, I think he's just grabbing her jaw, like to you know, subdue her or keep her from opening her mouth so she can scream or something. It's uh, just they, they, they are trying some things to set him apart from, you know, other killers. For one thing, he's not wearing a mask. Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, he doesn't, well, I mean, okay, none, none, most most slashers don't say anything, but, you know, he he seems to be not necessarily, like, you know, almost superhuman, like, uh, like except for his weird magic hand. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, he's, he's very specific in his choice of, of you know, victims. He's not, you know, choosing people at random. Yeah. I agree that it seems like um, his... Grabbing her is almost trying to silence her. So in some ways, I wonder if maybe he missed. Maybe he's supposed to cover her mouth and missed. And they just were like, let's keep it. It looks good. It looks scary. Or, or, or another one of our, our favorite ones. It's like, you, you want another take of that? Nope, we're good. Let's keep moving. <laughs> I don't have time. Moving on. I feel it's the rallying cry of this motion picture. If I had to peg it. And so after this, we are, he arrives via bus. And lo and behold... He just happens to be on the bus that is full of Cub Scouts that I have been brought about uh, to the beginning of this bachelor party to sing Here Comes the Bride, all dressed in white, stepped on a turtle, and down came her girdle. And just repeating that over and over again. And it's like they acted like, you know, okay, but we've been rehearsing this for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> How disorganized is this Cub Scout troop that they cannot memorize these four very basic lines, two of which they should probably have known via just social, you know, interaction. <laughs> You've been exposed to the bridal walk song. <laughs> I think, like part of this, I think my favorite part of the scene is like, you know, the guy, the guys are packing up for their, their bachelor party, you know, you know up in mm. the, you know, they're getting, I think they, they're going like a cabin or something. And then mm. one of them turns to, to her, her fiance, Phil, Paul, something yeah. like Phil. that. Phil. Phil, right. Uh, so one of his friends, when she's about maybe six feet away from him, very loudly stage whispers at him that there's going to be girls at this cabin. Right. <laughs> they're essentially picking it's up like, hoes along the way. If, yeah. I, my apologies, sex work is real work, but uh, that is the level of attitude that is given. Also, he holds up the largest piece of plastic on the face of the planet and is like, porno is here. <laughs> it's a fucking Disney clamshell of a box. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it's not beta. So he's not getting the best resolution for his board. It's straight up VHS or uh, industrial <laughs> industrial tape. Uh, I'm not particularly sure. Maybe it's quarter inch that he's working with, uh, which makes that uh, cabin that they're going to have with one hell of, uh, of a media setup. So, yeah, what? these three guys who are all involved with these three girls are like, this bachelor party is an excuse for us to have sex with a bunch of dim different women. And then you're like, Oh, those guys. And then the girls go off and like, all right, it's our weekend to start fucking around. What are we going to start doing? Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. One thing I do actually uh, like about this movie. I, and mm -hmm. I think it's, it's not, it's not terrible. I thought it very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. and, and actually I was, 
looking at through the lens of what I knew about Vincent's paper. And I, and I, I really could, it was an interesting way to, to view it. Cause I could really see that, that this goes beyond. And I mean, a lot of slasher movies tend to forget to make the characters likable and worth caring about. And, it's a and, new phenomenon. Yeah. And I thought that the, the, the lead girl uh, was, she was fine. You know, mm-hmm. I think, I think that her main issue was that she felt like she had to get married but, yeah, you know, because she's probably all of 22 and you know, the, right. clock, the clock is ticking. They are and, still in college. So one assumes that they, that she is in that 20 to 22 range for sure. But but she is very fickle as, you know, 22 year olds often are and, and should be. She had been dating this one guy for a while and that he went away for the whole summer. <laughs> and, yeah. and so she you know hooked up with this other guy and decided she wanted to marry him instead. But now maybe she doesn't want to marry him. And maybe she has still has feelings. She obviously, still has feelings for the other guy because she's not told him to fuck off entirely. Yeah. Um, you know, she very she is extremely tolerant of his borderline stalkerish behavior. <laughs> but her her friends are a very interesting kind of window into changing uh, sexual mores in in, mm. in the in the you. Know, in the late seventies and early eighties in a way that, you know, when you look back at it now, it seems kind of shocking. Yeah. Like uh, her one friend is talking about how she keeps seeing a guy on her jogging path. And it turns out to be a Tom Hanks's character who funny little aside here. Um, he was set up to be killed uh, in the same scene as the woman who ends up with her head in a fish tank. Oh. But the director liked him so much that he, <laughs> he didn't want to kill him off. So he just kind of ended up, you know, sort of just being in the movie for like about five minutes and then just disappearing. Uh, uh, that almost makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> I like this guy. You're allowed to live. Now, lady I've cast in this, you're definitely getting decapitated. <laughs> that's that's um, a lot of this movie is really coming together where I understand the secret sauce. But, but yeah, so she's talking about how she thinks this guy is cute and, mm-hmm. and, and her, her other friend's like, well, I'll just let him pick you up. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, uh, okay. All right. <laughs> Sure, just I got time this, to kill. You just stand around waiting for this straight. And then he then he picks her up by letting her trip over him. <laughs> yeah. Which I I suppose that might work. I don't know. Not, but it's, it works for her. So obviously it works to a certain degree. I, I was also uh, really encouraged by how Amy tells Phil not to drink too much beer because I guess it makes his penis shy. I'm not sure what that's about, but she does say, you know what it does to you. <laughs> it kind of, kind of comes across like if you drink too much, you know, you're not going to get it up. But well, oh, I mean, would, no, she, not, would, she, right. would she want him to, to drink a lot if he's going to be at his bachelor party? I, that's what I, I don't know. What it does. She's anti whiskey dick or pro. I'm not sure how it all works out. Or she, or she's worried that the effects aren't going to wear off in time for their wedding night. I don't know. Perhaps, maybe, because their wedding is either happening right when they get back or in two months. I'm not really sure. Of I think the they said. Two, I think they said date. two weeks. Okay. I, so she has two weeks to get a couch. That's <laughs> what it comes down <laughs> to. <laughs> she's given an assignment while she's got like pick up that couch. Like, why can't you pick up the fucking couch, Phil? We get to watch them uh, work out in, in a sort of uh, ballet bar uh, class that I guess they're in. Um, one of them is wearing a sweater wrapped around her neck, which, okay, that's how you want to do physical, uh, you know, activity. Later on, one of them is jogging with a full on wool wrap around her neck, which I just don't think, I don't care how cold it is. You don't want to run in wool. This just does not look like wedding season. This it, Everything just looks dreary and cold and miserable. <laughs> it looks like the cheapest time to get these locations. Is it's what it always, like. everything's gray. Uh, and if you want to watch a movie that will, will say to you, you will believe a woman can walk in Staten Island in ill-fitting pants. He knows you're alone is for you. You will get multiple scenes. It's almost as if like they don't drive enough cars so we don't get to see them park like we did in A Night in Heaven. Now we just watch people walk around. She is kind of 
Amy, our lead girl, she is shockingly left alone most of the time to take care of this wedding stuff. <laughs> Really I, I mean, I, I, you know, I have been, I, I, I have been married. I, I had a traditional wedding, and mm-hmm. you mentioned how uh, at the at the opener of the movie, or when we see the flashback of when Ray, our killer, uh, kills his ex bride, that she's completely alone in this in this yeah. room. Yeah, that's not mm-hmm. happening. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, from the from the minute you announce your engagement. There are constantly people around you and helping you do things and going to help you pick up your gown and going to look at the gown. And, you know, and, and she says every every aspect that she does, of the, I mean, she doesn't seem to have any parents. There's no there's, no, there's no they're out of town for the weekend. Oh, right, right, right. But like yeah. the her 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 friends seem disinterested in, in helping her like go, you know, get her gown fitted and to, you know, t- bring a second pair of eyes to make sure everything looks nice. She's just sort of like dejectedly wandering around from spot to spot, pl- yes. getting, getting these, the last details of this wedding together. Even the, She's- um, even the main dressmaker isn't there for her fitting. It's like the husband with the cigar smoking over her dress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know what goes great with uh, white is uh, cigarette ash. It's just... It just looks like, yeah, all right, let's get married, which... That's uh, that's not your attitude. That's not what your attitude should be when you're about to, you know, marry someone. You shouldn't yeah, have we, a, you shouldn't have a, well, this might as well happen attitude towards it. Yeah, this might as well happen, which was a thing we kind of started to notice in Friday the 13th when people would present, be presented with their death and are like, all right, you know, hands up in the air. <laughs> this might as well happen. Uh, is almost her attitude towards getting married. Like the only thing that fills the gap is being able to go into an ice cream parlor, get some ice cream. And we see this entire transaction. And then the phenomenon that happens throughout the film to each of, of the three trio, as it were, of, of women in this film, uh, she just gets scared. And it happens to each of them where they're like, holy fuck. And then they just go back to normal. <laughs> I'm not going to deal with that feeling that I'm a being followed or someone is looking at me or I am just frightened about the situation. They just get instantly horribly frightened and then go, yeah, I got the rest of the day to make this work. Yeah. You, know, you mentioned the, that the, the ice cream parlor, you see the entire transaction, which I'm glad because it has my favorite character in it. The, the older woman eating the giant ice cream sundae. <laughs> and it's so <laughs> melted. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 soup at this point, but she is just you know loving that soup, loving that ice cream gazpacho that she's digging into. <laughs> she's then horrified, uh, and I think we all are when Marvin arrives. Don Scardino, <laughs> Marvin, who I think is wearing a mushroom of hair on his head by the looks of it. Well, I mean that was that was much like tight pants. That was that was kind of the look back then. <laughs> it's just sitting on there like a wool cap, but it's made from his own hair. And his idea of how he's going to get Amy back, I think is just negging her and never taking no for an answer. Well, I mean, yeah, that's that's still a thing. <laughs> you know, but yeah, I, mean, right. <laughs> I mean that you know, the idea of, of negging is entirely the concept of the that that pickup artist thing is yes, right. You know, mildly insulting a woman, you know, till she thinks it's funny and then, you know, voila, she's yours. I mean, yeah. doesn't work for me, but you know, I can't speak for other women. And uh, so he's just going to wear her down. At one point, he tells an entire story about how listening to a woman said, say no cost him sex. And so he learned his lesson. He's never going to do that again. Yeah. yeah. I think that's like the most revealing thing about the attitudes. Like even regardless of the killer or anything else, that story there is really shows the attitude uh, against <laughs> right. women in the film. And I don't know, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to look at this from the perspective of when the movie came out. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not honestly sure if you're supposed to think that uh, uh, Marvin was a bad guy or because, you know, because he's so funny and clearly he's the one she wants to be with. And, and mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't know because 
you know, I guess if you compare him to uh, to Phil, who just seems like this, you know, you know, a pushy thug. Yeah, yeah, I guess he's a little better, but you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean it's a little bit of a you know, you know, shit sandwich versus you know, broken glass sandwich situation, but right. <laughs> you know, or or if you're supposed or if he's supposed to be another, you know, red herring, since he always seems to since apparently he's not above shaking down her little sister for information about, you know, what her schedule is that day. Right. Yeah. I feel like we're supposed to like him because so many characters tell us that they like him like they're trying to force us to like him even if they know they're not likable because joyce (laughs) her friend that has the affair with the professor she's like i love marvin and her sister's like i like marvin why don't you marry him and even the preacher or pastor whoever she goes to see in a church is like maybe you're marrying the wrong person (laughs) and stuff so (laughs) i feel like they're really trying to make you feel a certain way (laughs) phil has a rep in this town and it's gotten around because everyone is kind of like are we sure about Phil? Well, it's like, that, is that who her choices are down to? Phil or Marvin? Yeah, that's the only available men in town. I mean, Staten Island, Staten Island may be the, I believe it's the least populated borough in New York City. But mm-hmm. there's there's probably, she probably, she's an attractive young woman. She probably could has a much bigger pool of, of available men she could choose from. I think she could swing her purse in any of the locales that she's photographed in and hit somebody better than either Phil or Marvin. And yet it is presented as this binary choice that she cannot get out of. And, you know, how do we know that Marvin's the right kind of guy? Because he can conv- he can convince a wedding shop dress owner to let him just spy on one of his customers while she's in her underwear. He's great. I mean, no notes. Perfecto. Chef, <laughs> chef kiss. You know, uh, Vincent mentioned the, uh, the pastor and, yeah. uh, I love, but that's probably my favorite scene in the whole movie because it's just so weird about how she gets, she gets scared because it looks like the, uh, the crucifix is bleeding and, yes. and the pastor's like, Oh, that's just rusty water. I'll get around and cook about that. It's like, uh, you don't think that's going to be upsetting to your, to your, <laughs> to your parishioners of this Catholic church, Padre, if the crucifix is bleeding from it. I kind of like it that people think that Jesus is bleeding. I don't know. I might let it go. I might do something gives, about gives it. Little, Anyways, gives, Catholicism. It's a little character. I like it. Is Jesus the hottest guy in this movie? You know, I think he might be. No, I mean it's Tom Hanks, but even he, but yeah. I mean he's he's a cutie pie here, but still he's he like every other male character, he has a terrible personality. Right. Russell Todd is in this for like half a second. Isn't and he like the dude that gets killed in the in the like fake out movie? Uh, he yeah, I I think or it might be one of the friends. I'm not sure. Like it, he's not photographed well, which is weird because he's a very attractive guy. But of course, he's you know the guy who ends up in the snare in Friday the Thirteenth Part Two. So he's a really attractive dude. It's just you don't see him, so it's hard to call. I I'm I'm siding with Jesus as hot as Russell Todd <laughs> is. Also, Steve James is in this movie. Like he's part of the couple that's in that's interviewed by uh detective useless and he's like he spends half of the 80s in just shirtless because he's that fucking good looking and you barely get to see half of his face in this movie it, it's so distractingly like i'm not sure how cameras work directed that it's it's kind of perplexing uh, <laughs> anyways MGM needed product and this fit the bill. So this movie got sold. But before we really get into that church scene, which I do want to talk about, we do have to, we do have to note that killer Ray uh, once again, uses his magic hand to kill the dress shop owner. Uh, He's able to just grab him by the throat loosely and that paralyzes him. And he's just like time to be scissored to death. And then he's gone because I don't know. He's associated with Amy. It's a very, this is where things get a little bit loose. Like if he's just going after brides, that's a thing. If he's going after anyone associated with the bride, I think he's just kind of branching out is what this movie is covering in terms of Killer Ray's uh, career. Yeah, I think her, uh, well, I mean, I guess maybe he didn't, he he wanted to make sure her gown wasn't finished in time. (laughs) That's right. Uh, but I, he's, 
I guess he is the hands of the operation. He's the real, he's the real seamster uh, when it comes to uh, these dresses and his wife is uh, what he calls the customer service representative. But uh, anyways, uh, he's no longer in the movie, so we don't have to worry about him. Let's go back to this church where we discover that Amy kind of has like 25% of the sixth sense. She can sense something's happening, but she's not sure what. And this movie gives a cat scare to organ. (laughs) Not since toilet. And once again, Friday the 13th part two have, has an inanimate object been given this grand, a surprise scare, but it happens in this church. Also father McKenna kind of looking at Amy like you don't need to to marry Phil but you know I'm an eligible bachelor <laughs> it's, it's a vibe he's giving a vibe yeah yeah Amy has some sort of like you know pool on 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 the men she encounters I mean when every single person we meet in this movie is telling you not to get married to Phil Maybe listen to one of them. We we never and, and at no point does she she say why she wants to marry Phil. Like she never like she never defends him or anything like that. Right. You know she never pulls the whole you know oh you don't understand we're in love. Yeah. It, it, it really does feel like she has been you know you know court mandated to get married. <laughs> and, the only way she can get out of those traffic tickets is if she marries Phil. And that you know Phil is the one. She she you know she may not want to. She mm-hmm. may not need to, you know, something maybe, you know, telling her to, to, you know, run in the other way, but she has got to marry Bill. We need to make a prequel for that one <laughs> summer that Marvin was gone and there was some kind of enchantment that <laughs> binded her to Phil. Exactly. We got that to she see, cannot we break. Actually, we actually only see her and Phil together for like a very short time. Yeah. And then Phil isn't actually, isn't much in it at all. He's more talked about more than anything else. And, and then, like, at one point, he he's trying to call her. You can tell he's, the actor's not very good, but you're supposed to get the impression that he's getting, he's getting angry about the idea that he can't get her on the phone. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, but you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we need something. You know, why are you insistent on marrying this guy when everybody is telling you, don't do it, just do yeah. not? I think most of the main cast is is still with us. We could get back Caitlin o- o- Oh, Henny. Oh, I don't know how to pronounce her last oh, name. And Don's. Oh, Haney and uh, Don's Gardino and whoever uh, played Phil. And don't even de age them. Just do it as they are right now. <laughs> do they still have the same, like, you just can't just put, like, can't at least put wigs on them to kind of look right. like they're their younger selves? Yeah. Just film it. It doesn't even have to be a whole movie, it can be a short. We'll play it on Adult Swim at four o'clock in the morning. It'll be huge. Its audience will be three, the three of us. <laughs> That's right. The film has an interesting concept of how to photograph things. And um, I, I, speaking of uh, short, you know, films, I would like to present a, a quick one act play of uh, how everything was filmed in this motion picture. So the DP starts by saying, I'm going to put the camera in the middle of this room. And the director says, Oh, you don't want to move it around or anything, right? You're just going to keep it where it is. And the DP says, yeah, absolutely not. Every shot is just going to sit here, bored out of its mind, looking at one thing constantly. And that is the prevailing theory of how to thrill people uh, in this motion picture that the director has told people, this isn't a horror movie. It's a thriller. (laughs) Like, I don't know. I don't know if it is. I... I do, it's it's interesting. I do enjoy it. I think there's some charm to it, but charm is in the eye of the beholder. And I just, I could use a little, little bit of action here and there. Just a skosh, you know? Well, I, I think that they are, you know, as much as it does lift from Halloween, I think, I think it is trying to do something a little different, um, mm. which, which I, I appreciate. Like I said, I, in, it's actually, you know, I, I find it an interesting movie uh, in a way that, you know, a lot of other slashers kind of glom together. And again, I think it's because of viewing it through the lens of uh, 
Vincent's theory, which I think, you know, mm-hmm. adds an, an interesting dimension to it. Um, yes. Now, whether or not they meant that, I, I can't say, but I think it's certainly, you certainly can view it through that, which, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, considering the, the, uh, the, the time period and, and, you know, the kind of attitude, uh, the, you know, the very quickly changing attitude towards, well, you know, women don't have to get married unless they, you know, unless they really want to. But again, like the, the uh, perhaps more interesting than the, the, uh, you know, whether or not, you know, the slasher is going to be stopped in time is it's like, why does she have to get married? Why <laughs> is this so important? It's a really good question. Uh, and one we don't necessarily get an answer to. It's just it, no, we never it, get an she answer said to it. Yes, and so it's gonna fucking happen already. And then, and then in the um, end, she ends up just marrying Marvin anyway. She certainly makes that commitment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, spoiler alert: she may not make it down the aisle. I, I want to talk about this this next scene um, with Amy's friend and a very shirtless uh, James Rebhorn. Uh, don't get me wrong; I don't believe that sex should be, you know, should be humorless. But also, I don't know that it requires this much giggling. You know what I mean? (laughs) It's a a lot of giggling for, for, I I think, people trying to have sex. I'm not... I'm not a hundred percent certain. Yeah. I, I've never heard of chasing each other around the house as foreplay. Yeah. I was going to say <laughs> for me, it's more the running. That's unrealistic. I could giggle. I'm not going to run around. <laughs> <laughs> and, or if you, well, you're not going to, you're not going to like let your partner pretend to push you out a window or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. No. <laughs> yeah. That is interesting foreplay. The whole, I'm going to keep your legs inside and your torso outside and tickle you. Um, it does. Um, that doesn't work for me. I don't mean to yuck other people's yums uh, when it comes to that, but it seems weird. Yeah, please don't tickle. Please don't tickle uh, me. He's very adamant they have sex on a hard table, though. Yeah, that's pretty weird. And she's like, I don't want to have sex on the table. He's like, it's very comfortable. She's like, not for me. I'm underneath. And the second, uh, the solution to this, and, th- and this might have been revolutionary for the time, but she does not have to be on the bottom. That is not something that is required by law. I don't know all of Staten Island's local, uh, you know, bylaws, as it were. They weren't that quite progressive yet. Okay, <laughs> so so maybe they really just had missionary available to them. In which case, I am entirely on her side of this argument, regardless. Uh, this is very, uh, th- this uh, arrangement that they have is kind of an exchange. She needs an A in philosophy, and he's willing to, to state out loud the philosophy is complete bullshit. He just wants to have sex, and she's going to get an A. Uh, but then the lights go out, and her demand is, I need the lights on before we have sex. So, <laughs> hey, more power to her. Uh, he goes down to the basement, a very creepy basement. Uh, again, uh, again, another basement with chairs on the ceiling. Why are chairs constantly <laughs> on the ceiling of basements? I don't know. I mean, I live in California. We don't traditionally have basements here. So that's not, not something I'm well-versed in necessarily. But uh, every other movie we watch with a basement it has chairs stapled to the fucking ceiling. And I don't get it at all. I don't know how that's a storage solution. <laughs> Uh, but regardless, uh, he comes back. He looks at that fuse box and is like, I'm not going to be able to fucking f- fix this. I'll just go back upstairs. Uh, meanwhile, she's had, again, her own, I'm completely scared by what's happening, and then relax moment. And we get another shot of of Ray in a window, which is the exact shot they're making fun of in the opening of the movie, and it's happening here. So... I, I, is this the first meta slasher? Probably. Sorry, Scream. Oh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. Everyone thinks they're so fucking cool. Well, take that. Uh, ever Kevin Williamson, you think you're so damn smart. Also, he is very smart. I, I very much envy his intellect and his ability to write good characters. Anyways, <laughs> nobody watched the following. Uh, I promoted the following for two fucking years and I know nobody watched that fucking thing. So anyways, 
He finds her dead in a pool of blood. We're not really sure where she's stabbed. We just know stabbing has taken place, I assume. And then he gets a close-up of Ray uh, killing him in places. I, I'm assuming places. his crotch. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm really hoping for crotch shots with that knife. I mean, he really deserves it. <laughs> just just, just, just for how badly he he pretends he doesn't know, uh, which it's not Nancy, who's the other girl, the one that just got killed. Joyce. Joyce. For pretending when he, when he runs into her with the wife and be actually, like, I'm, I'm sorry, what is your name? With like you know, sweat yeah. beads running down his forehead. <laughs> also, she knows. Everything on her face says, I know this is happening. And it's kind of like, I don't fucking care. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it's clearly not, not his first time he's stuck with a student. I mean, come on. No. No. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Uh, so fingers crossed. There's a whole lot of crotch stabbing. We're just going to assume that's what happened. Also, uh, before this, he gets need in the crotch and calls her a bitch. But I mean, he is getting need in the crotch. But also, uh, she didn't do it intentionally. You fuck knuck. He's he's kind of an asshole. And I again, I hope he got stabbed in the penis. <laughs> We can only hope. We, fingers crossed. Joyce is a very, Joyce is a very interesting character. Like she's very much alive. I think this is a, a decent performance. I, I think like she pops off the screen here and uh, it's, I'm not, you know, everyone in a, in a slasher movie ha- is kind of wheat for the, the mill as it were. But um, I missed her for the re- remainder of the movie. She's she's a fun character. I mean, all, at least at least they they you know as opposed to a lot of other movies in the same genre, they do try to distinguish the 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 female characters, which 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 I appreciate. Yeah. They all seem to have their own personalities. You know, they they seem to other than the fact that nobody seems interested in in helping Amy, you know, run the last few errands she needs before her wedding day. Yeah, you know, they they all mm-hmm. seem to like each other for the most part. Yes, absolutely. Uh they they just they they all have lives and they have voice they're kind of like I don't think feel right for you. So I think they're kind of pulling away emotionally in the hopes that she might realize, I don't know. Uh that that's a that's a best guess. But this brings up something that we were talking a little bit on air and has a lot to do uh, with, with the uh, paper that, that you wrote, Vincent, in that this was a film that was highlighted in the, I guess it was Siskel and Evert's uh, previous show uh, to uh, their main uh, show that was uh, syndicated later on. In 1980, they like had a women in danger episode. And we've brought this up a couple of times on the show, but they bring this up like, the entire point of these women is to just have sex and get killed. And it's when you watch it, you're like, I'm not, is it? I mean, there's definitely a weird thing going on here in terms of its sexual politics, but I don't think it's presenting these women as the only thing they have to offer is sex and getting killed. They seem to have vibrant lives. And I don't know, Gene Siskel in particular, like, uh, a real prig is how I'll put him. Uh, not that he didn't have fine points, but when it came to horror, he was kind of a, a stick up the ass, as it were. Uh, Vincent, like, how does this the the women in danger special work in your philosophy of this motion picture? Well, I think it's tricky because, like you said, I think these characters really have good development, especially Joyce. Um, she doesn't seem to be she doesn't seem to be like the sexual character for the sake of others. She seems to have like pretty good agency over her sexuality and mm-hmm. things like that. But it's almost like they always get undercut by the men still. So like she seems to be very aware of what she's doing with her sexuality. She seems very in control of her relationships and she enjoys, she's a person who enjoys being in control um, and being in a little bit bossy. And, mm-hmm. but um, then you see like when he calls her a bitch, um, her professor calls her a bitch uh, that kind of takes away a lot of her power because it's like, he's only giving her power over him because of the sex. And once 
he gets that, you know, he's not really going to respect her in any way or anything like that. So in that way, it's like they seem well developed because of their relationship with each other and because they don't seem to just be saying stuff for the sake of other characters. But they get no like respect from the male characters. Same with like Marvin not respecting what Amy says. Um, yeah. And then with the with Siskel and Eber, a lot of the stuff they said was like that the audience members watching these horror films would be uh, kind of cheering on the killer and would be kind of putting themselves in the point of view of the killer for Mm -hmm. um, wanting to punish these women. And that was part of their problem was that it was encouraging these behaviors. And I would say that's why the marriage part of this or anti-marriage part of this is so interesting because I could see those kind of um, very misogynistic men who don't value women or stuff. Uh, Seeing the point of view from the killer that, oh, these are bad women. We don't want them in our lives and stuff. But at the same time, I see a lot of women watching it and really relating to these characters. So I feel like it all depends on audience member. You can't really make that generalization that um, it's only people coming to you enjoy the torture of the women or anything. <laughs> well, and that's, that, that always seems to be their general, um, you know, stab at the horror genre of the time. Granted, like they're watching every shitty horror film that's coming around in the, and in, in, in the aftermath of Halloween where, where everyone thought I have a camera, I can gather people, I can make a slasher movie. And then you watching, you're like, well, can you, uh, <laughs> and this is this is like this has an interesting twist to it where obviously it's it's not a who done it so you don't have to worry about that component of it uh it's more of a thriller procedural slasher hybrid uh but yeah it's it's kind of stating something that seems progressive and then at the same time having this equal weight if or if not more so of regressive misogynistic attitudes and it's an interesting you know combination of salty and sweet as it were i don't know that the balance works at the end of the day but again every film's charm really depends on you know how it works for you uh but i do have one question for you uh vincent as you're kind of the he knows you're alone expert is the idea that ray can turn into a crow while these women are jogging and that's how he's able to stay behind people and then not knowing it. He just flies past them as the camera indicates. Uh, is he a skinwalker? This is what I'm asking. <laughs> and you need to have an answer to it. It's very common. Everyone who watches the movie will be asking this question. I'm going to say that's what we will cover in the sequel as well. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hopefully there is some backstory as to how he's able to jog in a peacoat. Uh, but uh, regardless, uh, and this uh, Amy and Nancy um, are, are running in hopes of catching sight of this cute boy who uh, keeps uh, giving the eye to Nancy. And that cute boy ends up being Tom Hanks. Um, and they go to a, a local carnival together. Um, a, ca- a carnival looks like being, a, a carnival looks like it's being held in November. <laughs> everybody's like, everybody, everybody's wearing down. everybody's wearing winter coats and scarves at this at this carnival. Everyone's bundled within an inch of their <laughs> lives, as if there's six you know feet of snow on the ground. It's just very fucking cold. The winds coming off the Atlantic, I guess. But. Uh, we get, as Vincent denoted earlier, uh, for whatever reason, Tom Hanks does not have a dime to his name. Literally, uh, he has to borrow money from his date to call his roommate to say, get out. I plan to have sex with this woman. And she's like, well, I've got five dollars. And that is really the gender gap personified. Even when things are equal, a woman has to pay a man $5 to get his roommate out of the house so she can have sex. Um, Meanwhile, Amy and her sister, who seem to have an age gap of eight years, I'm guessing. Um, It's a like it looks like Diane uh, 
was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> she was an oops. She, she was an oopsie. Uh, came into this real late. Uh, but well, they I don't, go know, on how, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how old anybody else is in this movie because um, the the point where uh, Marvin is talking about how he wasn't ever going to let a you know, woman saying no stop him from having sex again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, he <laughs> says that this date occurred in 1971. <laughs> All right. And then he took her to a drive-in. So Marvin is like 27. <laughs> I, yeah. Oh, I don't know. It's really confusing. Everyone is between the ages of 30 and 11. I, I don't know. <laughs> and then at one point Di- during this conversation, Diane throws up cake in the sink in the background while Marvin's trying to get in Amy's pants. <laughs> I don't get it. I just, mm, I don't know. It's, it's really hard for anyone to, to get a grasp on, on the, on, on how they're, how to attract women or how, uh, how, what women want men. It's just, it's super fucking weird. Anyways, back to this dark ride, which appears to have been filmed in real time, but in the middle of it, of, of all these, just against a matte black background, the person in a mask popping into screen. We get a sound effect of Fred Flintstone running in midair before he makes contact with the ground. <laughs> the, with the with the tom tom. <laughs> I'm not really sure what that's about, but I did enjoy it. Killer I, Ray I, I, is I, I kinda also like that. In there. I kind of like that bit with the uh, sure. the, the, the fun house. No, I thought I, I thought it was pretty cool. It it reminds me of. Um, the what is the the film the monster a go go and the strange creature incredibly strange strange uh, creatures oh, who uh, stopped uh, living and became mixed up zombies mixed zombie, yeah the, yeah yeah and it has a lot of that going on and I like and I liked uh, when she was on the ride and she kept thinking she saw him in the crowd and all I thought, I thought that was pretty yeah. well done plus I also liked that yeah. ride so. <laughs> and it's I, worth and the I, fifty and, cents and, I said and I like and I like rides through fun houses. Sure, absolutely. The we cheesier, the, the, the cheesier, day. the better. They seem yeah, to, absolutely. they seem to just like want to throw as many kind of settings, horror settings, as possible. Because we have the movie theater, the carnival, yes. the forest <laughs> houses, the forest, <laughs> a dark, a dark old, house. Yeah, I was gonna say an old dark house. Yeah, a yeah. hospital morgue, <laughs> just everything. Right. A hospital morgue with a bomb shelter? I don't what is going on. It's like they're they're they've walked to the seventh circle of hell. I don't know what's happening underneath that building, but it is crazy. Anyway, yeah. we'll get there. Yeah, I like I like I like how Marvin uh works the morgue and just goes immediately from work to go visit Amy. He's not even changed out of his uniform. Um <laughs> he just shows up with corpse juice. I don't think he has a home. No. I think he might be living in one of those sub basements in the morgue for all we know. Um, after this, Amy kind of has a freak out and she's like, this man is following me everywhere. And it's either Phil or Nancy. I can't remember who says I'll cancel my plans and stay with you. And she immediately goes, no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is undercutting your real belief that someone is following you. It's like you're gaslighting yourself or society allows you to not be scared. I don't know what it is, but it's really weird and totally regressive and certainly interesting to watch. This is where we learn that Detective Useless has been sent to Staten Island and the, the cops there have no idea why he's there, but they're like, don't process the crime scene. Here comes an expert who's got a mustache and a constantly dripping nose. He's going to solve this murder for you. And they're like, okay, it's Tuesday. And <laughs> he's allowed to do it. It's, it's free crime scene day. Everybody gets, right. <laughs> everybody gets, a, everybody gets a shot. <laughs> yeah. Listen, we we're pretty sure we know this is a robbery, which is, I guess how Ray is given such, free reign like occasionally he'll kill a dress shop owner and rob them and he's like all right i got a month's worth of free you know uh cash here because we don't know if he's staying in a flop house somewhere or what's it like because if he's just staying out in the woods outside of amy's home again gina he must smell and he must smell bad <laughs> this movie not only name checks psycho but adds a shower scene but nothing comes of it so nancy does what we all do 
It's time to relax. It's time to smoke a dupe. Get on that green carpet. Drink a glass of marginal white wine. And listen to what sounds like depressed yodeling on a headphones. <laughs> you know, other than, other than the, uh, the yodeling, that looks like a pretty great night to me. Uh, honestly, she picked a better record. I'm into this. Like, this is a way to spend fucking time. But she is also grabbed by Ray's magic left hand. And as such, she is unable to move. And he motions that he's going to slash her throat. But the the film cuts away from it. We don't really understand what has happened to her until later. Um, But when her head is revealed to be inside the fish tank... I laughed for four <laughs> minutes. Is it the worst fake head? Uh, is it worse than the fake head in Friday 13th Part 7, though? That was the Gina, holy shit. We are of one <laughs> mind. This was the exact question I had. Is this worse than the Friday the 13th Part 7 head? And it. here's the thing. I think this is better because there's water involved here, right? Yeah, and it's going to be distorted looking. Right. It, you're looking at it through a warped lens and what kind of head appliance is really going to work in this situation. There's that there's that one movie that ended up being called, I think, The Day After Halloween. That's not really a Halloween movie. It's an exploitation movie. And they made a woman hold her breath. I think it's a guy. Hold it. Or I'm, I'm not sure. But the person, the actor held their breath inside the fish tank. While they filmed, and that's the only good head in a tank I've seen. But the one in Friday the 13th, part seven, is so comically bad and it's exposed to air. Its only purpose is to be in that potted plant so that when the psychic girl in that film picks it up with her mind and headbutts Jason with it, it becomes brilliant. That's, <laughs> that's what saves that. So I don't know. <laughs> Let's this call it draw needs then. a psychic. This movie needs a telekinetic girl. That's what I'm saying. With so many fish in the tank, I'm surprised there even like was a head there. They could have put a lot less in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they could have just been like a, like a, sc- a half eaten skull. At oh, this yeah. Point. <laughs> they're so hungry. They're sick of eating one another. And now there's this exotic meat come to town. Yeah, they would probably start nibbling on it right away. Um, <laughs> Oh my God. There's also a a weird thing that's happening with the music in this movie where the sense of dread thing is the movie has this one lingering high note that sounds like the opening of Dreamweaver, but the rest of the song never plays. And I'm just expecting (laughs) Dreamweaver to kick in at any point. (laughs) Vincent, have you ever heard the song Dreamweaver? Um, I'm not sure. (laughs) I would have to hear it again. (laughs) <laughs> have you have you ever seen have you ever seen Wayne's World? Yes, a long, long time ago when I was a kid. <laughs> the 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 song that he hears whenever he sees the the woman he falls in love with that's Dreamweaver. Okay. Yes. Again, young people, listen to the show with the Wikipedia page open. You'll get a lot of these jokes. It'll just be at least twenty five percent funnier. Um. So once Amy has seen a physical dead body, she knows. Okay. This, what I've been thinking in my head is actually real. And so she makes her way as fast as she can out of this house. And Ray, I'm not entirely sure what's going on here. Does This is a legitimately serious question. Does Ray have hemorrhoids? <laughs> because he walks like he has hemorrhoids. Well, he's sunburned. He's probably... <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you ever had a really bad sunburn? Like, like that shit hurts. Like you can't. Like everything, everything hurts. No, I have had a a truly bad. Uh, I, I like have had that, you know, um, sunburn sig- sickness afterwards. Yeah. Where I get you get a fever and cold slashes and your whole entire body itches. That's happened to me. That that's how pale I am. Yeah, that's probably you know he went on vacation. You probably went to a nude beach or something. And, you know, that's why all he has is the. Uh, that's why all he has is the sunglass uh, marks on his face, and he just <laughs> exactly he's just roasted. He has no tan lines anywhere. Else. He's just roasted all over, man. This movie would be better if Ray pulled the ten to midnight and murdered everyone nude. <laughs> see him walk into the the bridal shop just you know, hey <laughs> i just don't think anyone notices him 
Um, but once he, you know, makes himself known to Amy, then it's a, I wouldn't call it a chase. I call it a, she's jogging and he's moving at a pace that denotes he got off a horse recently and she makes it into the car and he just kind of flops in front of it almost on un, under the belief that he can tear the vehicle open like a bespinached Popeye. <laughs> and then she takes off. Thank goodness. And he attaches himself to the roof like a fucking Spider-Man's. And she manages to shimmy him off by running into a curb. But then she runs into a pole, but not really. They just prop the uh, hood up and like a puff a little smoke like, oh, she hit it. But the car is undamaged and the pole is undamaged. And she makes a run for the morgue where the dead people are where it's safe. And uh, she tells uh, Marvin, I, I'm right. My friend is dead. A killer is after me. And he immediately goes, I don't believe anything that you've said. Oh yeah. He's completely so, unhelpful. And speaking of unhelpful, uh, where the fuck is detective useless? He almost ran into two Staten Island locals and is unable to have his car recover after that so he's just dead stuck in the middle of the road but when he finally makes it to amy's house the the police dispatcher says oh we have a call come in from the morgue there's a woman there who says a guy's after her and he's like okay where is it and she gives two cross streets and he's like that's all i need he has staten island cross streets just in his brain he's a fucking (laughs) sherlock holmes Yeah, I, I don't know. That would be enough to get me anywhere. <laughs> Just two cross streets and the knowledge that a morgue exists in town. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that you know the morgues aren't prominently marked with morgue. <laughs> the the LA County morgue actually is. I love that building. Um, it looks a lot like this. Weirdly enough, like it just all looks like a morgue building. I don't know that they still use it exclusively as a morgue, but it it has the same sort of, you know, very stone and column look that this has. Um, What I wasn't sure about, and this movie educated me on this fact, and Vincent, I'm not not sure you're aware of this, but morgues are equipped with loose two by fours. (laughs) (laughs) And they're very good at stopping knives and killers. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They're they're excellent at stomping, uh, stabbing implements. But now we have Detective Useless shows up and we've got everyone in the same place, right? You got Amy, Mushroom Hair, Killer Ray, Detective Useless. And just to show you how great a cop this guy is, he wanders in, stumbling, knocks over a glass beaker, just trying to turn a corner. This is... One of our heroes, everybody. He can't walk around a corner without breaking something. (laughs) So Amy, you know, has a lot of uh, too close for calls. Uh, She manages to see the dead body of her friend. Uh, She makes it into, I assume, a basement that connects to where Hellraiser lives. (laughs) Just by the looks of it. And she gets cornered up against a hallway that is stacked from floor to roof with uh, upended desks and tables. Yeah, I don't, know what, I don't know what the hell this is. It's like it's like, I, a, it's like an old, somehow she's wandering into an old school. That's where they hold the morgue classes for the, <laughs> the new people, the right. new, I don't even know what to call them. <laughs> dead body 101, yeah. dead body 102, sure. And she is cornered. This is where we get the poster shot of her holding her turtleneck over her mouth. She's so scared. Uh, Again, uh, Amy, this actress, comes off fine in this motion picture. (laughs) None of the bad parts come from her acting. She's really trying to make this work. Ray has wrecked his face, and he's making an approach. And thank goodness, everyone, Detective Useless is on the case, and he shoots this guy. And Ray hits the ground and you think, well, this can't be over, but has he sustained a gunshot and he's going to get back up? Detective uses like Amy, you got to get up. You got to run. 
and he drags her up and pushes her off. And then there's Ray. And we find out that he's that Detective Useless has shot Ray in the elbow. <laughs> he's not an in, inconsequential man. He's not so slight that you can't like he fires off several rounds and only hits him once in the fucking elbow. But here's the kicker. It's in the magic hand arm. And after that point, the magic hand doesn't work. I, I've solved it, everybody. Ray had a real magic hand, and it can only be felled with gunshots. He just, he just He's shot like a him. werewolf, but just the one hand. He just shot him, and all the, and all the magic leaked out of the, uh, the gunshot wound. <laughs> That's how magic works. If you pierce the skin, the magic leaks out with the blood. And so... Uh, Amy is uh, in very dire straits here and uh, and Detective Useless is stabbed and the entire crowd cheers. Yay, he's dead. He did nothing. He did nothing. He was going to die of whatever that iron lung level illness was that was brewing in his lungs. So it's almost a relief that he's died. And then Amy makes her way out. I <laughs> Hair weasel springs into action. Vincent, how how does Ray die? Um, I don't. They she like stabs his arm a bunch of times with like a <laughs> scaffold, and then but he's still going, and yeah. then they leave, don't they? <laughs> I don't. Yeah, does anybody check if he's actually dead or not? I don't. I don't know if they ever actually show him dying, unless I was looking down at my phone at that point. <laughs> I know. I, I, this is why I wrote down. How does this guy die? Please ask Gina and guest. How does he die? It's just we assume that he dies. Yeah, it, it's pretty uh, anticlimactic because she just stabs a few times, like, oh, okay, we're done. We walk, they walk away. Right. Like we don't, like, we don't get they that. Make it to the cops and like movie over, everyone, and. And then the movie is pretty much over with the exception of one scene where we find out that Amy is now going to marry Marvin and she's Why? up in the same, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Phil died up in that cabin. Maybe there was a gas explosion. Who can say? But he didn't, but he uh, did die. Phil? Yeah. Oh, I mean, no one says it out loud, but I, he, no, she he died in, in Amy's heart. No. He's the one that Why? kills her. He's the one that oh, kills right. her. <laughs> Jesus, Patrick. <laughs> this movie confused me so much, I don't even remember we how did, it we did, We That's made a right. joke about how it's contagious. Like the, the you yes. know, getting so furious that you, you know, you, someone breaks up with you that you, you, know, you have to kill them on their wedding day. So this lends the question, when the magic leaks out of Phil's arm, does it, like the hidden, travel into <laughs> Phil and Phil is infected? With the magic hand. I was thinking it was more like, uh, what was that movie with uh, Denzel Washington? Was that Fallen? Where uh, Oh, yeah, Fallen. Where mm-hmm. people like just like kind of clap you on the shoulder, like a, like a you know, you know, hey, buddy, what's up? And you know, passes, yeah. it just passes on you know, the, the evil spirits to you. Something like yes. that. Uh, I don't know where Phil and, and Ray ended up meeting, maybe in jail, because Phil probably ended up in jail after that weekend. Let's face it. Um, but... Yeah, they cross consciousness and Phil's like, you know what? That guy who almost killed my fian- my ex-fiance had some good ideas. Um, I heard them in a podcast. They don't exist yet, but I got a feeling that they they transferred that way. And he's like, gonna kill my ex-fiance. And we're left with the implication that Amy has died. Uh, any final thoughts about he knows you're alone. <laughs> um, I, you know, I know that I watched this when I was a kid and it was one of those things where I, I initially, I wasn't sure that I had. And then the more I watched, I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I definitely saw this before. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, if you damning with faint praise. I think it is certainly among the, the better of the, the Halloween ripoffs. And, and I do mm-hmm. think that, you know, that, that the, the, uh, you know, the men who aren't serial killers aren't much better or much more helpful than the, uh, than the, than the, you know, the one, the person the who's the going. The two that are. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, uh, and again, I, I don't know if that was on purpose or not. You know, if it, if it, if it was, I think that's pretty great and, and 
you know, pretty daring for the time. But even if it, if it wasn't on purpose, I, I can't, you know, you know we, we've mentioned before about how we have characters in movies that because the, you know, the direction or whatever isn't, isn't, is too, you know, uncertain. They had to have the characters constantly talking them up and yeah. talking about, you know, how attractive they are and how smart they are and how good they are. When, when those aspects are not apparent to the mm-hmm. audience. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the, the problem here with Marvin is I have no idea what the audience is supposed to think about Marvin. Like yeah. when she, when it's revealed that she is marrying him at the end of the movie, I don't know if the audience is to be, is to be like, Oh yay, she's with the right one. or oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I, but I think that, I think that gives it an interesting angle that yeah. you know, was, was not present in a lot of other movies in the same genre. So I, I think for that alone, it's worth a watch. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Vincent, uh, what say you? Yeah, I talked a lot about what, how I find the marriage focus um, interesting. And I would say that cyclical nature of the ending is also one of the main things I like about it and find interesting uh, for discussion topics and things because it is kind of like these men are it doesn't matter if you kill one of them they're never going away they're just (laughs) always being made again but it's implied in my opinion that they're being made again by the choices of the women if the first bride wouldn't have uh decided to marry the um detective then Mm. then ray never would have killed anyone if um amy had never decided to marry marvin then this new cycle of a killer in Phil would have never started. So it is just interesting how it's just always a cycle and it comes back to a woman's choice. And I think that goes along with some other things we see, like the uh, movies that have mothers that abuse their sons that then become the main killers in the films like psycho. And he knows, um, or what is it? Don't go in the house. Um, Same thing. It's like, okay, there's a cycle of, these bad killers but they're all starting with women so yeah that's a that's an interesting i I, again once i started reading your take on it like the there's levels to this movie that i don't know are intentional but are are just unintentionally kind of interesting to, to dig into and then there's the movie itself which you know, charm is in the eye of the beholder, but I think is at least worth a watch. Uh, and Screen Factory has a very beautiful presentation of it. Like it's this is the best this movie has ever looked. That's for sure. Uh, so I think it's worth people's time and attention. It's out for rental. Like you can you can see it pretty easily now. Uh, so yes. Before we go though, uh, <laughs> I hate to bring it up, but we need to choose our own death venture, and that is where we decide. Of the deaths presented in this film, uh, if we were to choose uh, one way to go out, which one of those would we choose and why? Of course, uh, let's start at the very beginning. That is to get bunked through the back of a movie theater seat, or you can get a chin grab slash phantom stabbing in a wedding dress. Uh, You can be stabbed with scissors while complaining about your customers or die in bed somehow. Uh, How about getting stabbed in close up? Uh, but the shy this the, with the shot of the killer with his face in a crazy rictus, maybe get stabbed in the penis. Uh, you could be decapitated while listening to soft rock and end up with your head in a fish tank, or stabbed in the badge for sucking at your police job. And then, of course, you can be killed by Phil, the greatest insult of all. <laughs> and so, Vincent, you are our guest, and that is why I'm going to ask you to go first. Well, I would pick Nancy's death. Um, getting decapitated, not because okay. I necessarily want to get de- decapitated, but more because it kept her from going on a date with that philosophy 101 major that wanted to analyze everyone. <laughs> I think I'd rather sure. just go ahead and like die while smoking and not deal with that <laughs> in the future. Sure. <laughs> so. No, she goes out doing what she loved, smoking a dube and eating on a carpet. Um, Gina, what say you? You know, I, I find I think I, as far as minor characters are concerned, I I, I really like the um, the bridal shop guy, mm-hmm. and and you know I I I have I, I I sew and I have several pairs of very large scissors, 
you, you sure. usually, you know, within a few, you know, feet of me at any given time. So if someone's going to break into my house. That's probably what they're going to stab me to death with. So that's, you know, that, that, that seems, that seems fitting, so to speak. It's the price of being crafty, honestly, Gina. Exactly. You, you've sown the, you're sown your own seeds of your, your own demise. Exactly. Uh, as far as I, as far as I'm concerned, as much as I would love to get, get, get bunked, I'm not sure I want to die in the CD movie theater. And so I think I'm going to die in bed somehow because at least I will have need James reborn in the nuts. Um, <laughs> and that's the best way to go out. Uh, that just about does it. You know, our, our theme is by revenge body, go to band camp, look, put in revenge body. You can get a whole album of our main theme and the remixes. They're great. And all of our artwork is done by, uh, Josh Hollis, uh, and Vincent, uh, where can people, uh, find the stuff that you've worked on and see it and read it? Um, I mostly post stuff on my Twitter, which is at slasher day saint. It was supposed to be a pun of the Church of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> so Slasher Day Saints. Oh, my God. It's still haunting me after all these years. Um, yeah. So I got, I posted the uh, link to my paper that was about He Knows You're Alone. And I've also, I posted other things. And then I posted, um, I did, for my blood insurance, I did do a video essay on um, Don't Go in the House, which has a lot of the same themes as what I saw and he knows you're alone. So if you like, like these topics, that's a good one too. I highly encourage people to seek that out. I think you, you, you have a great take on that movie, which is super interesting to watch and super, it, you know, as far as a, a psycho take goes, it, it does some cool stuff and has one of the more interesting characters in horror movies. We might have to cover that movie one day. Uh, please, everyone, seek that out. Gina, where can people find you on these here internets? Well, before I do that, I wanted to just, uh, we have having another uh, good period for Patreon. So okay. if I could just uh, say welcome and thank you very much to Brian, Colin, Neil, Kay, uh, Laura, Lisa, and Mikey13. Those are all our oh, new Patreons for the past uh, about- I three weeks or so. So thank you very much. Uh, just to let you know, uh, if you're at the $10 level, uh, I'll be reaching out to our, our winner of the next uh, drawing to choose a movie for us to watch. I'll look out for that later this week. And as for where you can find me, I am on, uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram under Gina does things. And I write about movies and television at the spool.net. Do it today. People check it out. You can find us on Twitter and we have a Facebook group. We're at Instagram. We have a great Patreon. Uh, we're going to have a, a, you know, a listener selection in the middle of the month. And of course, at the end of the month, we'll be talking about the amazing, the incredible Halloween six. Yes, it's come to that. Uh, and so uh, you want to be on board for this. And it sounds like a lot of people have, they've reached out to us and let us know they're enjoying this, which I, uh, I find surprising and delightful. Uh, but that just about does it for all of us people don't worry the, the body count will continue for myself and gina and vincent bye-bye everybody bye bye